worship at Harvard Avenue Christian Church, now meeting in sanctuaries all over Tulsa and in fact around the country. Wherever you are, we are so glad that you are in worship with us today. If you're in our sanctuary, we hope that you took time as you came in to find your worship kit. It has your connection card and communion for later in our service. In your sanctuaries at home, we hope that you'll use the links below this video not only with our connection card to record your attendance and to share your prayer concerns, but also our online giving link, our link to the worship bulletin for the morning. And today is the first Sunday of Lent, and we begin our journey toward the cross. But first, we have some work to do. This year, we're marking a different kind of fast. We've prepared a Lenten guide that you received by mail as our February and March newsletter. It is also on our website, and we are sending it out each week, one page at a time, in our worship emails. If you're not receiving those emails from us, be sure to contact the church office to make sure we have the right information for you. In that Lenten guide, you'll see ways to follow the theme for each week with our sermon text and our key verse and the thought for the week. There are also some questions for reflection. There is a prayer. There is a city labyrinth opportunity, a way for you to move around the city when it's safe to do so and experience some of Tulsa's city life and have a devotional there as well. This is something that you can also do right from home, even if you aren't able to get to these locations. There is also a chance for you to respond, a call to action each week to help you live out the theme of Lent. This year, a different kind of fast. What might it mean for us to put aside the things that distract us and focus our spirits wholly and entirely on Christ? As we come to a time of prayer, I hope that you have noted in this morning's worship email all of the folks in our congregation and our community for whom we invite your prayers. I would invite you to still your hearts, remove the chatter, let's take a moment of silence, and then I'll pray for us together. generous, loving, creating God. This has been such a week for so many in what has already been such a year for so many of us in so many ways. Such a year of concern and distress, such a year of loss and anxiety, such a year of change and new meaning such a year and such a week filled with storms and concerns and roads and pipes and electricity and water and all of the things that we so easily take for granted now being first and foremost in our minds. Our safety, our health, 
our comfort, such gifts that we often neglect, and such things that we know so many do without on a regular basis. As we continue to connect and check in on one another and recover from what damage the storm has done, may we bear in mind that from our gratitude, from our abundance, we have the opportunity to provide for those who deal only with scarcity. May we be generous in our contributions, generous in our prayers, generous in our creativity, in our faithfulness, in our compassion. God, we pray that you would Bless particularly those who are first responders, who are healthcare workers, electric line workers, those who repair damage to streets and utilities. We pray for those who are doing everything they can to offer leadership in such trying times. We pray that you would give us patience as we wait. God, we come into this season of Lent knowing that there is so much for which we can be thankful and so much that we can still work on together. So we pray that in this different kind of fast, you would help us separate ourselves from the things that distract us, from the habits and practices that pull us away from you, and that you would help us to fill those spaces with repentance, that we might truly turn from those things and toward you, and that you would fill these spaces with new opportunity, new ways to go deeper, to reflect, to reconsider, to reshape, to renew. God, we pray that you would move in our hearts, that you would transform our spirits, and that you would move us into your world different because we have been here with you today. Wherever we are, however we worship, listening or watching, in part or in whole, focused or sometimes admittedly distracted, we pray that you would bless us, guide us, direct us, turn our hearts toward you. We pray in the name and for the sake of our Savior Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, good morning. That just put me in a real, thank you, Brian, that put me in a real good place to deliver the message for today. Today's the first Sunday in Lent, and we're beginning this sermon series called A Different Kind of Fast. And what we're going to do during this season is each week we're going to focus on one thing that stands between us and being the people that God is creating us to be. I use the word creating because we're works in progress. That God is working on us and and dealing with us. And in Lent, what we do is we create these quiet spaces during the season where we say, God, here I am. Show me what you want me to see. Show me who you want me to be. Reveal to me what you're calling me to do. And for that to happen, we have to be willing to give up all the chatter. We live in a world of constant, noisy chatter. We are wired 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. And not only are we wired for sound constantly and bombarded by sound every day, internally, we have so much internal chatter. The reason we turn to the external chatter is because we don't want to listen to what's going on inside. When we get quiet, then we have to hear stuff about ourselves we don't want to hear, that voices, that running monologue that takes place in our our heads, our fear, our anxiety, our worry. You're not enough. I must tell you, to be completely transparent, this is really difficult for me. Being quiet. I like to talk. I like to go places. I like to do things. And the idea of just being quiet for 10 minutes is just absolute torture. And I have an ADHD prayer life. I sit down to get quiet with God and say, okay, God, I just want to be here with you. Oh, look, a squirrel. God, where was I? Boy, I could use a bagel right now. Oh God, where was I? What do I have to do later today? It's very difficult. And so what we're going to hear is we're going to hear from a psalm of David. Uh, These words have just been a part of my week. And I hope they'll be a part of your week. It's titled, A Song of Trust in God. And David writes in Psalm 62, verses 1 and 2, For God alone my soul waits in silence. From Him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall never be shaken. Now we see that this psalm itself was a part of the life of Jesus. There was a consistent, constant pattern in His life where He went to quiet places. The word for wilderness in the Greek is the word eremos, eremos, which means desert, lonely, desolate, quiet place. He went to the Eremos many times in his ministry. Here we are on the first day of his ministry and the beginning of this this 40 days in the wilderness. He writes in verse 9, chapter 1, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heaven torn apart, torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. I was made familiar this last week or a week or so ago about a biography of Martin Luther King Jr. written by David Garrow, Pulitzer Prize winning biographer. And in it, he tells a really interesting story about a very pivotal, important day in Martin Luther King Jr.'s life when he was in his late 20s 
in 1956 on January 27th. It was a really critical day for him. At this point, he had been uh, the head of the Montgomery Improvement Association for a little over a month. This association was put together in response to the incident involving Rosa Parks on the city bus. The first 30 days on the job uh, as the head of this commission were very difficult. He received death threats. And uh, it was a really scary time for him. And he became very worried and concerned because it didn't look like the city was going to budge. And he thought it was going to end very quickly. But instead, it was going to go on and on and on because he thought it was not going to end anytime soon. At that point, his resolve on January 27th, his resolve had begun to wane. And he was worried if he was going to survive it, if his wife Coretta, his daughter Yolanda were going to be killed, if he's going to lose his life. He's a young father, young man beginning this big challenge. In fact, the day before, the day before January 27th, he'd received numerous death threats and had been arrested for allegedly driving 30 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour zone. So you can imagine on the night of the 27th, filled with fear, anxiety, and worry, he goes to sleep and he can't sleep. He's worried about everything, about his family, his life, his mission, his calling. Can he do the job? Is he going to have to give it up? So you know what he does? to stop all the chatter going on inside his head. He got up and he went into the kitchen, made himself a cup of coffee, sat down at the table, and there he was just quiet and sat before the Lord. Now many years later, about a decade later, he was preaching a sermon about this very night, and this is what he said. He said, there in that kitchen, I bowed down over that cup of coffee. I'll never forget it. I prayed a prayer. I prayed out loud that night and I said, Lord, I'm down here trying to do what's right. But Lord, I must confess that I'm weak now. I'm faltering. I'm losing my courage. And it seemed at that moment that I could hear an inner voice saying to me, in that moment of quiet, he could hear this inner voice speaking to him saying, Martin Luther, stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth, and lo, I'll be with you even to the end of the world. Now we know the rest of the story, and we know how he prevailed. But what happened in that moment of quiet when he sat in that kitchen and he, he shut out the chatter of all the things happening in the world around him, and then he got still and was able to shut down the chatter and the worry and the fear inside his mind, God spoke to him in the silence, centering him, grounding him, affirming him, and perhaps even hearing that same word that Jesus heard in the wilderness, I'm with you, I love you, I'm proud of you, you belong to me. And it gave him the courage to go on. Now, this is a challenge because we, we, we know that if you read Scripture again and again, when is it that God speaks? God is not going to bulldoze His way into your life. That God is going to patiently wait until you're still to speak. Because again and again, from Elijah to Noah to David to Abraham to Rebecca to all these biblical figures, Jesus, Moses, when does God speak? When they're quiet and they're still, that God whispers in their ear. So think about it for a moment. What would have happened if on that night, on January 27th, 1956, if Martin Luther King Jr. had an iPhone? What if that night when he went in there and he walked into his kitchen, made his coffee, and set his iPhone down on the table next to his cup of coffee. And the moment he said, dear God, I need help, there was a text message that came. And it was another threatening text message. And he did what we all do in moments of boredom and anxiety. He picked up that little device and began to scroll through Twitter to see what people were saying about him. He would have been distracted. Would he have been able to hear from God? Let me ask you a question. Some of you won't remember this because you're too young, but some of you older people in the room, and there's some older people in the room. You know who the older people are? Anybody that's older than you, right? Do you remember 
Do you remember when you would go to the grocery store and stand in line to check out your groceries and you had nothing to do except read the headlines on the National Enquirer above the chewing gum rack or talk to the people around you? Do you remember when you'd get up in the morning and make a cup of coffee and you'd put your Pop-Tart or your waffle in your toaster and you had nothing to do to entertain yourself but just to sit there in the silence? But now because of technology, because we're wired 24-7, we do what others do. In those moments of boredom and quiet, we, we, we invade that quiet space when God might speak to us, those porters, those moments of solitude, by reaching for our little screen. Now, if you, go to, if you go to Starbucks any day of the week and you're standing in line to get your coffee, people are not talking to one another. They're not quiet either. They're looking down and they're not looking up and around. Many of those quiet moments that used to exist in our life are gone. And the tragedy for, the, the tragedy for this is, is it makes it difficult for us to be present to ourselves, to God, and to one another. Now, there's a good reason, there's a good reason why we are distracted by this outside chatter. Why? Because we want to avoid the internal chatter. Because we don't want to deal with the voices inside. Because once we get quiet, that's when the demons speak. In the text, when Jesus gets quiet, who shows up? It says Satan shows up and tempts him. Well, we, when we get quiet, we hear all these inner demons. The demons of anger and fear and frustration and worry. That voice that says, God doesn't love you. We start comparing ourselves to others. We start having a running commentary on our relationships. The conversation that took place at work. The things that make us worried, scared. The things that shame us. You're not enough. You don't have enough. And so it's a lot easier... It's a lot easier to pick up the little device or to turn on the TV or pop in the earbuds than it is to get quiet and to be still. Now we can learn a lot here from Jesus. This story teaches us about the life of Jesus and about the habit of solitude and stillness in his life. It says that Jesus is baptized. He hears this voice from heaven. I love you. I'm proud of you. You're my son. What a big moment. And you would think at that moment, it, it, now knowing me, if it were me, I would have charged straight out of the baptistry, straight up to the podium and start speaking. I would have gone to a rally, I would have performed a miracle, I'd have done all kinds of cool stuff. Let's, make, let's raise the dead and draw, draw a crowd. But what does Jesus do? He goes out in the wilderness for 40 days to do nothing but to be quiet. And then after he's quiet for 40 days, he deals with his temptations. He has his first day on the job as the Messiah of the whole universe. And what a day it was. It was a marathon day. He preaches sermons. He heals the sick. He drives out demons. He goes to Simon's house, has a meal, heals Simon's mother-in-law. And it says in the text that they were bringing the sick and the demon-possessed to him late into the night. Now, it would have been expected that the next morning that Jesus would have got up early in the morning, not early, he would have slept in late, got up about 10 a.m., gone for a light run, then treated his disciples, his newly recruited disciples, to brunch at Denny's for a Grand Slam breakfast. Nothing like hotcakes after a hot day of ministry, right? But what does he do? He charges straight out into the Eremos, the desert, the lonely place again. Now, let me clarify. He has just spent 40 days in the wilderness being quiet before God to hear from God. And the very next day, he spends one day in ministry. He was just too busy not to pray. He goes straight back to the wilderness. And we see it over and over and over again in his life. But the story's not over. Uh, Simon comes up to him and says, man, what are you doing out here? Everybody's looking for you. Don't you know there's a big crowd waiting for you? I mean, you killed it yesterday. I mean, you knocked it out of the park. What a sermon, Jesus. I mean, they want to interview you on the local Galilee Times. Come on, let's go, let's go. 
And Jesus says, no, we're not doing that. We're going this way. Because in the wilderness, in the quiet place, he was able to hear that voice of God again that says, you belong to me, I love you, and I'm proud of you. And because he was quiet long enough to deal with the demons in his own mind, he was able to live an intentional, purposeful, God-filled life. Would you, for this season of Lent, be willing to just be still for 15 minutes a day? Not trying to accomplish anything, but just say, here I am, God. Here I am. And when you get quiet, when you get quiet and those voices begin to speak in your head, let God touch them. Because what you're doing there is when you're in the quiet and all that anxiety rises up, it's the the voice of the one that says you're not enough. You're not good enough. But the God who loves you, the God who claims you as His own, wants to speak words of peace to you in that moment to heal the hurt inside and to give you direction. A few years ago, I went on a sabbatical, and uh, I went overseas to Europe, and uh, I ran a marathon, I backpacked, uh, traveled all over Europe from Scotland to Poland, and in the middle of that experience, I went to a Buddhist monastery. Now, that was quite an experience. There were people from all over the world there, atheists, Buddhists, Shinto, Japanese priests. It was kind of like Buddhist church camp. It was really interesting, but it was also really difficult because you know what they do at a Buddhist church camp? Nothing. (laughs) Long periods of silence. And in the silence, I realized that I was tired that I'd spent 20 years sprinting as a minister, spinning plates and sprinting from vacation to vacation to get rest, and my soul was exhausted. Well, in one period of part of the day, we had an opportunity to speak and to talk during that period of the day, and uh, I made friends with a professor, of New Testament professor from London, and I was telling him about my experience and what I was feeling on the inside, and then I told him, I said, This is a a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for me to have this moment to be here, to be quiet, and to travel, and to do all these things. The next day and the next time we were able to talk, uh, he said to me, I feel sorry for you. You feel sorry for me? I was stunned. Honestly, I was stunned by what he said. I said, why? He said, why do you have to wait 20 years to travel and see beautiful things? Why do you have to wait 20 years to get rest? Is that the way you're supposed to live? Spinning plates, being disconnected from your soul? Why would it be a -a once-in-a-lifetime experience and not a part of your daily life? Whoa. Whoa. Truth with a capital T. This is what I learned, and it's a constant challenge and struggle for me because I'm a doer, is that in your life and in my life, God has given us every day a day of Sabbath rest. It's daily quiet and peace. But you've got to be willing to give up the chatter, disconnect, and just sit and be quiet. And the way you do it is just to say, here I am, God. When you get distracted... Here I am, here I am, and wait until you're still. And God, God, at some point, if you're still long enough, it's different for everybody, believe me, if it takes you 10 minutes to get still, it takes me an hour and 45 minutes. At some point, you will hear this word, this peace that comes from not doing anything but just being in the presence of God. 
So it's woven into our lives. This, this quiet space is woven into our life that every day we get a little Sabbath. Every weekend we get a Sabbath. And every Lent we get a whole season. The psalmist says, For God alone my soul waits in silence. Do you bow your heads with me? Amen. One final thing. There's a book I would like to recommend to you to help you with this. It's called The Invitation to Silence and Solitude by Ruth Haley Brown. We'll make it available to you this week so that you can find out about it. But I would encourage you to use this as devotional material. Ruth Haley Brown, An Invitation to Solitude and Silence During the Week. Uh, take that book and read it during the season. It will help you.
each time we gather as a people of faith around this table to remember the works of Christ, we enter into a mystery of our faith that in the breaking of bread and the outpouring of cup, we experience the very presence of Christ Jesus. So today I would invite you to take those elements you have to participate in the Lord's Supper and to just hold those and enter into the awe of this beautiful mystery. body of Christ broken and given for you. The blood of Christ poured out for the many. Father God, something so simple, everyone could do it. Open your heart and let him come through it. Open your hand and eat the bread. No need for anything else to be said. Open your mouth and drink what's available. He's the one that set the table. Thank you, Father, for these gifts. Don't let us be remiss. Amen. Friends, the gift of Christ for the people of Christ. Thanks be to God. Friends, we're grateful that you could be in worship with us this day. And we hope that you'll continue to commit on a path of worship and study and prayer throughout this season of Lent with us. That we might prepare ourselves more fully for the good news of Easter that lies ahead. For now, I hope you'll take seriously the offer to check out the Lenten guide that we've provided so that you have some questions for reflection, some other opportunities, even around uh, this week, 
the theme of chatter and how we might shake that from our daily living. I would also invite you to take note of the purple cloth over here, which begins a kind of set of traditional symbols that we are lifting up in Lent. We begin with that purple cloth, a color of royalty and dignity, marking the honor of the Son of God, the one who had the power and might to lead a people to freedom and wholeness. It's also the same color that represents repentance and self-reflection. And so as we go forth from this place, and we do so with the humility to go forth, to find the places of quiet center that we might experience Christ's presence and share it all the places we go. May we go forth in the name and for the sake of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Thank you.